this is really going to help you because it's comprehensive. We're going to get through all of cardiology and it's going to be so efficient for you guys. All right. So we talked about atherosclerosis. Now let's transition a little bit to hyperlipidemia. We have a 45 year old male. He's going to have a BMI of 26. His cholesterol levels are 200, which are kind of high. However, look at his triglyceride concentrations. Those are super high. Which drug will be most effective in decreasing triacylglyceride concentrations? What's going to be most effective in decreasing these triacylglyceride concentrations? What drug? That's going to be fibrates, exactly. So fibrates, the mechanism of action of fibrates is that they are going to upregulate lipoprotein lipase. And what does lipoprotein lipase do? Lipoprotein lipase is going to increase triacylglyceride clearance. The more lipoprotein lipase you have, the more you are going to clear all of those triacylglycerides. Phenofibrates are also going to activate PPAR alpha. And what does PPAR alpha do? It promotes the uptake, utilization, and catabolism of fatty acids. Now, in your USMLE study, there is going to be another agent, a PPR gamma regulator. And this PPAR gamma regulator, what is that going to be used for? Diabetes. Yeah, exactly. That's going to be used for diabetes. Excellent. So PPAR alpha, that's a fibrate. That's for lipid stuff. PPAR gamma is going to be for diabetes. This is like so innovative. Isn't it innovative? Because yes, you get confused sometimes about alpha and gamma. Which one do I need to know? So gamma is going to be related to diabetes mellitus. And we are talking about the drugs pioglitazone and rosiglitazone. And what these glitazones are going to do is they're going to bind to the PPR gamma nuclear transcription regulator and in diabetes increase insulin sensitivity, which is going to be really important in lowering glucose concentrations. So. Moving on, a patient presents with multiple nodules, especially around the heel area. His serum triglycerides are 344. There is a family history of MI in a 20-year-old brother. That's pretty young, isn't it? What is the likely mechanism behind the findings? Yeah, so exactly. So this is going to be familiar hypercholesterolemia. Okay, Familiar hypercholesterolemia type 2 is a defect in LDL receptors. That's going to cause premature atherosclerosis, high triglyceride concentrations, and a early history of an MI, especially in a family member. So the mechanism of action of the medication which best reduces triacylglyceride levels, that's going to be the fibrates. They upregulate LPL and increase triacylglyceride clearance. They're going to activate the PPAR-alpha um, uh, receptor, and we talked about that in the last slide and how it differs from the PPAR-gamma. Let's talk about aging. So what are the features that are consistent with normal aging of the heart? Normal aging of the heart, you are going to be thinking of a decrease in left ventricular chamber, apex to base dimension. You're going to get more of an S-shaped ventricular septum. You're going to get more collagen deposition, myocardial atrophy, the muscle itself, and accumulation of brownish cytoplasmic inclusion as lipofusion. And lipofusion, the mechanism, is that it is a product of lipid oxidation. Hemosiderin is going to be an iron breakdown, uh, 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 iron breakdown um, inclusion. And you tell the difference between lipofusion uh, and hemosiderin via Prussian blue stain, because hemosiderin lights up on the Prussian blue stain, which is an iron specific stain. A 68-year-old male with three days of increased severe chest pain, shortness of breath, difficulty swallowing, and non-productive cough. Sick or not sick, guys? Sick. Excellent. Okay. Long-standing history of hypertension and smoking. Blood pressure is elevated. Physical exam shows visible pulsation above the manubrium of the sternum and displacement of the trachea to the right. Any, uh, anytime you have displacement of these anatomic structures, think about something getting really big and pushing on the normal structures in that area. You hear a murmur at the second right intercostal space. What's the diagnosis here? The aortic aneurysm. So aortic aneurysm, this is going to be in the thoracic area because look at the different um, uh, physical exam findings. Phys visible uh, pulsation, particularly at the manubrium of the sternum. Now, chest pain on your USMLE is very difficult to kind of localize sometimes. And there are key characteristics because chest pain can be a GI pathology, can be a heart pathology, can be an MSK pathology. So this is really important for us to kind of think about. It's not just the heart. 
28 year old male in the emergency room 30 minutes after shortness of breath. You have three year history of cocaine abuse. Temp is 38.1, pulse is 100, blood pressure is elevated. Physical exam shows diminished pulses in the left upper extremity. You have crackles heard all over the lung fields and you have a two out of six diastolic murmur at the left sternal border. Chest x-ray shows a widened aortic arch or a widened mediastinum. What are you worried about here, guys? You're worried about dissecting aneurysm. So this dissecting aneurysm, the key buzzword that you're going to see on imaging is a widened aortic arch, okay? And that is it really important because dissecting aneurysms are associated with hypertension, bicuspid aortic valve, can be related to inherited connective tissue diseases like Marfan syndrome, and because of this patient's uh, drug abuse, that cocaine can cause you to have increased amounts of pressure in that, um, in that aorta, okay? So the type A aneurysms involve the ascending aorta, type B are going to involve the descending aorta. A patient with atherosclerotic risk factors undergoes a myocardial perfusion test. He is given dipyridamol. And what dipyridamol does is it decreases flow to the left ventricle, which on angiography shows the potential for ischemia. So this dipyridamol is going to decrease the flow to that area. So what is the likely etiology for this acute change? What exactly is going on when we gave the dipyridamol? Yeah, exactly. So this is going to be the diagnosis of coronary steel syndrome. So basically what happens is, is that you get blood flow in ischemic areas and that gets worse as blood is shunted to well-perfused areas upon vasodilation. Dipyridamol vasodilated that area and the blood actually uh, uh, went to a more better perfused area. And that's coronary steel syndrome. So what other medication causes increase in coronary blood flow and can be coupled with thallium or um, norepinephrine during perfusion testing? What other medication can be coupled with it? Well, adenosine, okay? Adenosine is also going to be used to increase coronary blood flow, and the mechanism of action of adenosine is that it's going to hyperpolarize. It's gonna increase potassium out of cells, thus hyperpolarizing the cell. What is the likely mechanism behind acute myocardial ischemia caused by coronary artery disease? Acute my myocardial ischemia caused by coronary artery disease, you are going to be thinking of an atheromatous plaque formation causing coronary artery stenosis. That, that plaque is, is plugging up that coronary artery. The rupture of the plaque, occluding greater than 90% of the lumen, that is going to cause this myocardial ischemia, okay? Now, what is the most common cause of death after, a myocardial, after myocardial ischemia caused by coronary artery disease? The most common cause of death is going to be an arrhythmia. And typically, it's going to be an arrhythmia of ventricular fibrillation. We see this a lot in terms of, hey, patient just had an MI, and now the arrhythmia, um, after this arrhythmia, they died. A patient presents dead to the emergency room. Autopsy shows complete occlusion of the LAD. What's the LAD? Left anterior descending, good. What is the likely cause of death? Well, ventricular fibrillation. It's the most common pre-hospital cause of death in myocardial infarction patients, okay? Arrhythmia, arrhythmia, arrhythmia. So what's the most common in-hospital cause of death following a myocardial infarction? That's going to be ventricular failure. Some sort of, hey, I had a myocardial infarction, I'm in the hospital, and you can get structural changes, and one of the structural changes is going to be left ventricular failure and cardiogenic shock. Remember, these structural issues take about three to seven days for them to surface, okay? And other presentations on your USMLE for structural changes are going to be things like mural thrombi, ventricular rupture, as well as tamponade. A patient presents with substernal chest pain, which he noticed after a hike with his grandchildren. Go grandpa. He said that the pain stopped after he rested on a bench. Yay, it stopped. He is a smoker and exam is normal. What is the likely diagnosis? Yeah, exactly. So this is stable angina, okay? Stable angina is a deep, poorly localized pain that relieves with rest or by activity. The treatment is to give something like nitrates and this will cause you to vasodilate the vascular smooth muscle. 
What would you see on pathology? Well, on pathology in angina, you're gonna get atherosclerosis of the coronary artery lumen greater than 75% of that lumen, however, less than 100%. And these plaques overall can rupture and then usually can get superimposed thrombi. And we talked about this when we were introducing atheromatous plaques. If they rupture and almost, not 100%, but almost occlude the whole lumen of the coronary vessel, what pathology does this refer to? They almost are going to occlude the whole thing. That's going to be unstable angina, okay? Unstable angina and the other pathology, which is going to be an end STEMI, these are two pathologies that is almost occlusion. However, the key thing that differentiates them is what? The troponins. Subendocardial infarction gives you positive troponins. End STEMI, positive troponins, whereas unstable angina, negative troponins. Plaques that occlude, not partial, but the whole lumen, i.e. you get a transmural infarction when we're talking about whole artery occlusion. And this is in the gross pathology. Okay? All right. So when we're talking about myocardial infarction, when we think about the inflammation, the inflammation at one day is going to be a neutrophilic in inflammation and coagulation necrosis. At one week, the macrophages are going to start coming in, and at two weeks, you get this granulation tissue that is going to be more neovascularized. There's going to be vessels there, okay? And it is at that one to two week ratio, or uh, uh, week er uh, uh, time period, that you're going to get these structural complications from the heart. At one month's time, the patient will have scar formation. And so one antiarrhythmic, a good pharmacological tie-in, is best after an MI. Those are the class 1B beta blockers, okay? And the class 1B um, uh, antiarrhythmics, okay? Class 1B antiarrhythmics, they are going to be lidocaine, mexiclinitine, uh, okay? And the good way to remember this is 1B best, 1B best after a myocardial infarction, and you can uh, remember the names with that mnemonic as well. A patient presents with bradycardia, chest pain, and increased cardiac enzymes. EKG shows elevations in 2-3 AVF. When we're thinking about 2-3 AVF, what is the likely coronary that is going to be affected? That is going to be the RCA, exactly. 90% of the inferior wall um, of the heart is going to be right dominant. So 2-3 AVF, we're thinking about an inferior MI. Patients are going to have elevated central venous pressures, low cardiac output, and low pulmonary capillary wedge pressure because you are infarcting the bottom of the heart and you lose a lot of preload when you infarct the bottom of the heart. So what is the mechanism of RCA occlusion and bradycardia? We talked about this in our first hour when we said that the right coronary artery supplies the SA node. What would the LAD distribution, that most classic description that we think of in terms of leads of LAD, where do, we, where do we think of that? Well, that's going to be ST elevations in V1 through V4 on your EKG. How about the lateral ventricle? That's going to refer to what vessel? The circumflex, and that's going to be V5, V6, 1, and AVL, L for lateral. Okay, so this is the coronary um, anatomy, and remember, the big one is going to be this left anterior descending. So let's go into a little bit of treatment of an MI. A patient with an MI is treated with oxygen and nitrates. He is about to go to the cath lab for angioplasty. He is given one dose of morphine prior to his procedure. He suddenly develops flushing. After giving morphine, he gets some flushing. What is the likely mechanism that, um, that's going on with this patient? What does morphine do? Morphine is going to cause you to have a little bit of a histamine release, and that histamine release is going to cause itching, and that's a really important point. We see this a lot in pediatrics um, as well, okay? A patient with history of cocaine use presents with hypertension, anxiety, and sweating. His troponins are elevated, and he is diagnosed with a myocardial infarction. He is given a beta blocker, propanolol, and what effect does this beta blocker have on his total peripheral resistance? After cocaine, the beta blocker, if you give a beta blocker after cocaine, that is going to cause you to have an increase in total peripheral resistance, okay? These beta blockers, non uh, inhibition of the vasodilation that is beta 2 mediated, and you get this quote, unopposed alpha. This is a very good vasculitides um, uh, that you need to know for your USMLE. So Kawasaki, tune in on this one. Five-year-old male with irritability and emesis. 
He has had a fever for the past week. Anytime you see a kid with fever greater than five days on your USMLE, think about Kawasaki disease. His exam shows scleral injection and a palpable node two centimeters in size in his neck. He has distal uh, swollen extremities and a strawberry tongue. What is the most severe complication of coronary artery aneurysms? And we treat Kawasaki's disease with IVIG and aspirin in order to prevent these coronary artery aneurysms. So another USMLE point is talking about differential for a strawberry tongue. Not only are you going to think about Kawasaki, but also remember strawberry tongue presentation could be scarlet fever as well. So treatment is going to be aspirin. Even though there's a risk of giving kids aspirin with Ray syndrome, you're going to give it because the benefits outweigh the risk and you give IVIG to decrease the amount of inflammation and the potential damage that this vasculitis can cause. You also get a palms and soles rash when you're talking about Kawasaki disease. And so this is the differential of Kawasaki, uh, of a palms and soles rash, and Kawasaki is one of them, okay? And we'll get to this in our DERM module, but here, is, um, here it is for you to at least just uh, review um, right now. All right. Reperfusion injury. This is a good biochemistry tie-in for you guys. A 58-year-old female in the emergency room for two hours of shortness of breath and chest pain radiates to her back between the shoulder blades. Respiratory rate is high. Physical exam shows diaphoresis. EKG is normal. However, coronary angiography shows occlusion of the marginal branch of the LAD coronary artery. No good. Revascularization. She got a stent placed. However, now CKMB and troponin 1 after the stent is increased. What is the mechanism behind this increased amounts of lab, lab like the CKMB and the troponin? Well, it's going to be this perox uh, peroxidase mediated membrane damage. Remember, when you have an occlusion, biochemically what happens is you get free radical buildup before that occlusion. And once you uh, introduce the blood flow again, you can get this reperfusion injury. 24-year-old female presents with chest pain and shortness of breath. She has a history of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome along with a heart murmur that is documented as a mid-systolic click at the apex. She now presents with a holosystolic crescendo murmur with associated thrill. What is the likely diagnosis? She has Ehlers-Danlos and now this holosystolic crescendo murmur. That is going to be the mitral regurgitation, and this is due to chordae tendinae rupture. Remember, Ehlers-Danlos patients are going to really have that connective tissue problem of the chordae tendinae um, causing mitral regurgitation. What would, this, what would make this murmur louder? I know this is a topic that gets students kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, nervous. Okay? Things that are going to make this murmur louder are going to be things like hand grip, expiration and squatting. When you increase the amount of blood in the ventricle, that is going to make the murmur of mitral regurgitation louder. A decrease in afterload makes this um, worse because now you're going to have more forward flow of that blood and less blood in the heart. What is the murmur which led to the mitral regurgitation? What is the murmur which can lead to the mitral regurgitation? Well, mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse can lead to mitral regurgitation. And basically what mitral valve prolapse is, is it's a redundant valve tissue associated with connective tissue disorders on your USMLE like Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos. So what makes mitral valve prolapse a little bit louder? That's going to be Valsalva and standing. Valsalva and standing are also going to be making hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy louder as well. An EKG in a post-MI patient shows bouts of a wide complex tachycardia with characteristic tombstone-like pattern. Few months after, the patient has no pulse. That's not good, right? Patient has no pulse and now a tombstone-like pattern. What's the next best step? How are we going to save him, guys? Yeah, we're going to shock them, exactly. Unsynchronized cardioversion and initiation of CPR. When you're thinking about unsynchronized cardioversion, there are two arrhythmias which, like Gray's Anatomy, you're going to get the paddles ready and poof, shock the person. And those two arrhythmias are going to be pulseless ventricular tachycardia, that's this, and the other one is going to be ventricular fibrillation. Okay? And this is where you do unsynchronized cardioversion.